Good morning, everyone. Happy Friday. Uh, we're going to go ahead and get started um, with the USAS portion of the fiscal year and checklist. Um, if you're not able to um, they can use it more than once. If you're not able to see my screen, please let me know. Um, I've had a couple confirmations that people can hear me okay and, and see everything okay. What I have up there right now is the USSR checklist. Um, I'm sorry, the USSR presentation. I'm going to go to the page where we have all of our information. Lori Miller and I have been updating that, um, still updating it this morning. So I think we've got everything up there. Um, so let me take you there first. I'm just going to move my PowerPoint out of the way. And so in here, under the wiki, under the SSDT meetings and trainings, we have the redesigned fiscal year end meeting information here. So we have our agenda, and um, this is the first time that we've really done an official uh, fiscal year end meeting with the redesign. Last year, we just met with those few ITCs that were on the um, redesign last year at this time, and we just kind of went through a checklist. So this year, um, Lori and I have created more materials out here, um, supporting materials, an actual presentation this time, um, updated the stuff um, regarding inventory and things like that. So you're going to see um, everything in here. Now, will some of this possibly change before the start of fiscal year end? Um, possibly. So, you know, this is something where, you know, you have questions about what you're seeing on here. Um, you know, we can work through those things together. Um, when it comes to reports and things like that, we're just giving you recommended reports so the districts can run whatever they want for fiscal year end. And I'll talk about that when we get to that point. Um, but off to the left-hand side here, you're going to see the UCAP fiscal year end information. Um, so we've got... Um, Oh, okay, there we go. Um, I have the USAS presentation, so this is the actual PowerPoint. So that's available for you guys to take, and it's, it's more generic. So if you guys want to add a few things for your ITC, please take this and tweak it and make it your own. And then we have our year-end checklist on here as well. And for inventory, um, there really is, obviously, there's no inventory in the redesign yet, um, but I wanted to talk about the extract that's out there in our appendix, and I thought I would add that to here so you guys could, um, we could cover um, what's involved with extracting the data out of the redesign, um, those invoiced amounts and, and detailed information out of the redesign, and then importing into EIS, Classics EIS, using their um, import program. Um, anything else regarding uh, inventory, I have a reference down here to the classics PowerPoint and checklist information because basically, you know, in order to create that sequential file in uh, for to be uploaded in the data collector, you need to be using classics EIS system to create that or using, if they're not on EIS, using the SFE program in order to do that. So. Um, we'll, we'll go ahead and we'll get started with the USAS closing. Like I said, I'm going to be covering this presentation right here, and then we can also reference the checklist, and we can also go into an instance if you guys have questions. Um, I may go in there as well just to show you some things while we're going through the steps. So I'm going to go back to my PowerPoint here. <clears throat> so in here, I just explained uh, where this information is at. So it's on our wiki here under SSCT meetings and trainings. You're going to see the classic information on the left and the redesign information on the right. And underneath that 2019 fiscal year end, when I click on that, it took us to that page that we were just looking at. So um, closing, pre-closing steps that they can done, be done um, ahead of time if they choose to. Uh, first off is the district building and financial data. And so uh, with the redesign, it's located in the, underneath the organization menu, underneath core. So when it comes to the central office square footage and the ITC IRN, those are in that program. So the building information is going to be underneath the periodic menu. 
So I just highlighted exactly which ones they are. And so, um, so those things, I don't believe those get imported over, so you'll have to double check that. Um, so uh, whatever they had in Classic, if they obviously haven't had any changes to their central office square footage, or, and obviously the ICC IRN, um, then you need to enter that information, or they need to enter that information in there. So that's where, so this is basically the replacement for USA EMS DB, the um, actual central office information. There's also um, a place for the district building information. So that other portion of USA EMS DB um, is underneath periodic under the building profiles program. So if I just go back here and take you to periodic, the building profiles information right here. And so they're gonna go in and enter in their transportation and lunchroom percentages in here. I'm gonna go ahead and just click on create so you can see what it looks like. And they're putting in the IRN, the description, square footage, transportation and lunchroom for each of the buildings. So just like they would have in classic in the USA EMS DB program. So if they want to reference that information, they can go into classic, take a look at that, and enter the information in here. And so you'll notice once they add things, uh, those, those things will appear on the grid. And then obviously every year they can go in and edit this information and make any changes to their transportation and lunchroom percentages. So I, those things aren't carried over uh, from the import. So um, they will have to go in and add that information. We also have a report out there um, underneath uh, that one of, our, one of our template reports, so you can pull it up through the home page or through the report manager, and it's called the SSDT District Building uh, Information Report, and so that can be generated as well, and it's going to show the transportation and lunchroom and square footage information for the buildings. So it's very similar to Classic's report option under USA EMS DB. Okay, the next thing is validating accounts. In Classic, we had the ValActs program, and that went out and, and looked at a lot of different things. Um, it, we don't have the same exact report in redesign. We do have uh, an account validation report, and basically this is just going out there to ensure that there aren't any invalid account dimensions. So it's just checking to make sure that those are still valid. So if there are invalid account codes or account dimensions, they can use the account change program under utilities to change it to the correct dimension. So that's where I've added this note here saying that this is only going to check for invalid dimensions. So some of those other warning messages from Classic Val Act, and I have them listed below, um, like the ODE warning regarding the OPU to be entered for a specific function object or the function object and receipt codes must be defined at a higher level, that subject instructional warning message that we've seen for years, and the EMIS, valid EMIS categories, those are not um, verified through this report, just invalid dimensions. So um, instead, and what's gonna happen is um, when it gets to the actual data collector, those things are also checked then. So any messages that come through at that point um, through the level one or level two reports, those contain any fatal errors, um, then the district can make changes at that time. Um, if the district's already closed out for fiscal year 19, they can reopen June of the prior year and make any necessary changes. So. It's not an end-all end or be-all like it used to be in classic, and we'd have to, you know, get their archived, you know, data, make changes, things like that. 
um, don't have to worry about that in the redesign. If, you know, they're doing this, in, you know, they're running their data collector and they're already closed out for the year and they encounter a fatal error, um, they could go back in, like I said, reopen June of fiscal year 2019 and make any necessary changes, like an account change or something like that. So just wanted to, you know, let you guys know that it is more possible in here than it was in Classic. And in the uh, checklist, I believe, I'm going to go back to the checklist. When you reference um, the fiscal year on checklist, I was just looking to see if I have any further information on that. No, I don't. So it just shows, it just explains. So I have a little more information about that particular step on the slide than I do in the actual checklist. Okay, EMIS fund categories. Now, <laughs> we have been trying to find out from ODE if these are even in use anymore, and we have not gotten a, an official word from them about these EMIS fund categories. As you guys all know, they've been out there forever, and they've never changed. If you go and look in the EMIS manual, it's still the same information. Um, we did not um, implement the actual drop-down of all the EMIS uh, fund categories in the redesign. So if you would go to a particular cash account and you would click on the EMIS fund category field, it's just a field. What was in, what was in classic will get imported over, um, but there's no like drop-down to choose anything. So if they had them in classic for particular funds, those will get imported in and they'll stay there, you know, it's, they're still there. Um, but like I said, we're not 100% sure if those are still being used and we just have not been able to get any confirmation from ODE on that. So when I was looking through the level two report explanation as well as that general issues guide that ODE has, it doesn't appear that ODE issues any fatal error for the missing EMIS fund category. Well, you all know in classic, they have to have them because that's the way it originally was designed and I don't believe USA EMS in classic gets generated if there's a missing fund category. So we, you know, it's kind of enforced in classic, but like I said, we're not sure if they're still using them. So with that being said, last year when we were doing this, I included the steps to check the existing EMIS fund categories on the cash accounts um, because we weren't sure and unfortunately we still aren't. So if your districts would like to proceed with re reviewing and updating their EMIS fund categories in the redesign, just in case, um, they can perform the following. Um, and so I just have steps here where they could go to the cash grid or they could even do an advanced query um, and add that EMIS fund category column to the grid if they do it that way. Filter, and I've got um, an example of what I've done here. Underneath that, I just have the greater than, less than sign and then an actual space and it's gonna go out there then and find all of those cash accounts that have an EMIS fund category. And if they wanna look at those and compare them to what's out there in the EMIS manual on section 6.2 of the cash record, it contains the listing of fund categories. Um, they can do that. If there's one that doesn't apply, they could enter in an asterisk in that EMIS fund category field in the redesign. But like I said, you know, that stuff I don't know if that at this point is still being heavily, is still being used. Um, but if they were to keep doing what they were doing, like they did in classic, they could go in and just verify that these are still correct. I wish I had a better answer for you guys, but that's all I know right now. If I hear anything more, obviously before the start of the fiscal year end, I will let you know. Um, but like I said, I have not seen anything in the um, level two or anywhere in the general issues guide saying that this is considered a fatal. 
So it never was in the past either. <clears throat> Another step that we had in Classic um, was checking operational units and just to confirm that everything's good with those, they are found underneath um, core. There's the OPU option underneath there and they can view them and just make sure that everything looks good. Obviously, we do have an SSDT OPU listing report, um, a template report that they can run as well to make sure that everything looks good. And just a note that the IRN for the all zeros OPU has to equal the reporting district IRN that's been in place for years, so. Okay, moving on to appropriations. Um, they can use the scenarios option under budgeting uh, to enter their next year proposed amounts for both their budgets and revenue. We do have a step-by-step -step procedure um, that it goes through the budget, a budgeting scenario and how to run it. So I just have the link here provided. It's in our wiki underneath the appendix. Um, and so for those of you that um, your districts haven't done any budgeting yet, um, you can reference this information. Obviously, their budgeting can be done too in the next fiscal year. So those are some steps they can do um, before they get started uh, with actual closing for the month. <clears throat> so when it comes to closing out for June, um, they're going to enter all their transactions for the current month and reconcile their uh, UCS records to the bank. And we do have a bank reconciliation procedure um, that's provided in, in the wiki, and they want to go in for their cash rec. I know that they don't have to do that every month throughout the year, but um, they will need to do that for June because that information is going to get pulled into the data collector. So under the periodic menu, they're going to select the cash reconciliation option to enter their cash information for the month. And for those of you that may are not very familiar with it, it's a very quick, um, simple program that's out there. So underneath periodic, we have a cash reconciliation. It's much better than classics program um, under USA EMS EDT. And so basically when I click on create here, it's going to bring up, <coughs> excuse me, um, where they go in and enter all of their information. And everything is just on one screen, which is really nice. And then down at the bottom, it's going to pull in the cash amount uh, from the system and compare it with what's been entered. So here's an example of what one of them looks like here. And so in here, they would go in, so your gross deposit, well, first off, the posting period, so it would be a June period. And then to enter in their gross depository amounts, they would have to go down here first and enter in that information and then the amount, click on add, and then it will appear in this window. And as they're entering this information in, they're also going to get calculated amounts here. So anything that's showing in gray is going to get automatically calculated based on what's in this window. So the other information <clears throat> that isn't grayed out is where they're going in and actually entering in their cash and transit to the bank, their outstanding check amounts, things like that. So they do have to enter that stuff in manually. So we've got the gross depository balances, um, any adjustments, other investments, petty cash, and change cash. So all that information gets entered in. And so from there then, the total balances is what's getting calculated from all of their entries that they're manually entering in. So this is what the total balances is what they're entering in in the cash rec program. And then this is the total fund balance that's getting pulled in from the system. So these two should match. So um, they will get a warning if they don't. It's not a fatal, it's just a warning. Um, but uh, uh, when they try to save it, it'll say that these two are out of balance. Um, but that's, that's it. And oh, also down here, they can do their gross depository clearance amounts if they want to track those. 
they can enter that in here as well. So once that gets saved then, it's stored on the grid. And what's really nice about that is that when it's, once it is saved, um, if they want to start using it, uh, because it's not nearly as clumsy as the old classic program, they can go in then and pull up that prior month's reconciliation and there'll be a clone option and they can clone it to the next month and it will pull all of those entries they made in. And so if they've got, you know, when you think about their, um, you know, their different banks and maybe adjustments and investments and stuff that they're entering in, they might have quite a few entries in there. It'll pull everything over into the new month. Obviously, they'll just go in and change the amount and save that. So, you know, in essence, they will have a bunch of um, entries here for each month for their cash rec. So that clone option is going to be a time saver for them. that. And so the next thing that they can do then is generate a cash summary report and a financial detail report. Um, they should be in balance. I know that they, you know, had to do that in prior, in um, Classic because those were all stored amounts in Classic. So they just wanted to ensure that everything was still in balance in case, you know, something funny happened in the middle of the month something didn't get updated correctly, and those amounts didn't get stored correctly. And the redesign, it's not that much of a concern because these are um, amounts that get calculated and totaled on the fly. So, but um, we, we decided to leave this step in here just to, for reassurance for them that everything is in balance. <clears throat> Okay, um, if the prior steps are performed and the totals agree, um, they're in balance and they may proceed with the next step. So you'll see that there are some steps missing, like bell check. They don't have, to, there is no, no bell check in um, redesign because again, there are no stored amounts. Everything gets calculated on the fly. So a bell check doesn't have to look for that stuff anymore, uh, or redesign doesn't have to because everything's on a database. Um, where in Classic, like I said, all those amounts were stored. Um, so it, you know, that was one way just to make sure that everything was good. We don't have to worry about that in the redesign. So things will go a little bit faster for them. Um, and you guys are probably already aware of that because your districts have been closing uh, the months you know, in redesign. So um, they'll probably aren't using um, some of those steps that we had to use in Classic. They can run an optional spending plan summary report so it's just an optional step like it was before. It just depends on the district. And if they're used to writing that and because they're, you know, creating that report for their board and things like that and they just want to get into those, that same type of habit in here, then yes, they, we've got a spending plan summary report that will do the same thing. Um, with the month end reports, yes, they are going to have to manually run them like they are now um, if they're live, obviously, in the redesign. So, these are a listing of the reports that we recommend. So we've had that out there in our monthly checklist. So I basically copied them and pasted them into this um, PowerPoint. Um, monthly CD, I know, is like everyone's biggest um, enhancement that they want done um, in the redesign. And we're close. We're able to archive, you know, the um, data from Classic, but to generate a monthly CD within the redesign is not available yet. Um, but um, I know the prioritization committee um, has, you know, has strongly, you know, keep kind of reminding us that it's really important they want to get that out there. So it is a big priority for us. So this, again, is just the listing of those reports. So it's similar to the report that they ran in Classic. We're just showing you the actual name of that report in the redesign. <coughs> So again, so account reports, transaction-based reports, these are just recommendations. They can run whatever they want for the month. So um, if there's other ones they want to run beyond that, they can. So when it comes to fiscal year and closing then, <coughs> here are the steps to close out for fiscal year end. 
And most of this is nice because it's all underneath the same area in the redesign. It's under the periodic menu for the most part. So obviously the cash rack was done when they were um, balancing June out. So just confirm that that's been completed. And then we have these options underneath here under periodic for the old um, USA EMS EDT options, federal assistance summary, the detail, and the civil proceedings. So under the federal, federal assistance summary program, they're going to enter uh, the necessary information for the current fiscal year. Now note um, that, and I don't believe this has changed from last year. If it has, I will let you guys know. But what I was told is the summary option must be completed before the detail option in order to link them together. So I'm going to go back to our instance here and just show you where this information's at. So we've got the federal assistance summary and the federal assistance detail under periodic. So if I click on the summary option here, um, again, everything's all grid-based, <clears throat> and it's going to ask me for the actual year um, assistance over threshold. And again, we do have tool tips on some of these options to check if you have 750,000 or more in federal expenditures for this period, any comments you want to make, and then it's going to pull uh, the county and the entity from the configuration screen. It's going to pull that in. And that's it. So obviously at the end of this year, that will be saved. Next year when they go in, they can just go in and um, edit this if they need to. The other option is the detail. And so with this one, if I click on Create, um, it's going to provide um, the federal assistance summary. Um, I think here, the line number, the CFDA, the grant title, the cash account, the federal, uh, the amounts that they received, and the amounts that they expended. So I'm thinking this one right here is probably the year. So that's where I have to have, that's why I have to do the summary first. <laughs> when I put in 2019 then for my summary, that information will appear here to show that that's the year. That's what that's for. <clears throat> and so once they enter in this information then, it's saved. So next year, um, if they're still using, um, you know, that grant and stuff and they receive money, <clears throat> they can go in and make changes to it. Um, and so in anything new, obviously, they, they can create. So no, we don't have an initial, initialization, initialization option in here. Um, so I do have a tip here on the slide. So for those 500 funds, because the initialization option in Classic would go out there and find all your 500 funds and find the you know, expended amounts and the received amounts and pull them in to USA EMS into the federal detail uh, records. Anything outside of 500, maybe in 006, what other money they received from the federal government, they would have to manually enter in. Um, we don't have an initialization option in the redesign, so, but everything's in there in the grid. So once they add their first year's information, it's just a matter of making changes and adding, removing things for the, uh, uh, future years. Um, but what they can do is they can go underneath core accounts into the cash uh, button and query all their 500 funds, pulling up the uh, expended amounts. They could go in and run a report, a cash summary report on just the 500 funds and pull in that amount. So there's lots of different ways for them to get that information. Um, and then obviously then they're going to use that as a template and then that will go in <coughs> to the actual detail information. So what goes in line number? Um, I'm going to go back to, I think I just explained that, but um, so line number, just like in um, classic, they just basically put in their own line numbers. Um, so um, it's going to be the same thing as they did in classic. So they can just put in one, two, three, four for all their different federal assistance um, information. So good question. There. 
The civil proceedings, um, they're also asking, is there any specific order or does it not matter? I don't believe so. It never, there was no specific order in the uh, classic program either. So um, I don't believe there's any specific order in redesign. Civil proceedings, um, so if they have any civil proceedings, uh, they can enter that information in there. Um, if they don't, then that can be left blank. Um, so if you know any of your districts have an ongoing lawsuit or anything like that, um, they would have to enter that information in. And let me show you what that looks like as well. So underneath periodic, civil proceedings, and I'm just going to click on create. So, and again, the same type of information that you entered in classic is in here. So, um, proceeding number is a made up number again, just like it was with the detail option, and then all the information. So, you'll see underneath the board role and the obviously the participant role, you can select from plaintiff or defendant. So, and you'll also notice that anything in red um, is showing that you can't save the record without entering information in there. <clears throat> okay, go on to the next slide. The extract then, and when you think about it here, if I go back, I'm going to go back here to my uh, menu. So underneath periodic, fiscal year end wise, we went into the building profiles and entered that information. The district information is found underneath core and organization. So we, we hit those already. And then we talked about the cash rec and the federal assistance summary detail and the civil proceedings. So those take care of the programs that need to be entered in for fiscal year end. So at this point then, we're ready to extract the information um, to be pulled into the data collector. And we're gonna get into the EMIS extract here is what we're gonna do. But first off, before generating the extract file, do you have to make sure that the EMIS SOAP service configuration, and this is found under system configuration, is updated to reflect the 2019 period. Um, I have a question here. Do you have to still open civil proceedings if you don't have any, like classic, or you can just leave it go? As I recall last year, we just left it go. We didn't enter anything in for those districts that were on uh, classic last year. If there's anybody from <laughs> any of the other ITCs I don't that were, that were um, in wave one last year, I just think about our one district that was on, we didn't enter anything in the civil proceedings um, to, just to have a record like you had to do in classic. That was a flag that was set in classic um, because it was classic, um, so I don't believe we have to worry about that in the redesign. So going back to the EMIS extract, so this is found underneath configuration, the EMIS SOAP service, just to make sure that that is showing 2019. <clears throat> so once that's done, underneath um, the extract menu, um, you're going to see an EMIS option. And so what this is going to do then is it's going to create a sequential file that's going to be uploaded into the data collector. So I believe there are, if I remember last year, there are warning, message, warning messages that may be issued if the cash rec, the federal assistance summary detail, and civil pro proceedings, ah, I said civil proceeding programs have not been completed. Um, but again, it's just a warning, so it's, it's not a, a fatal or anything like that. So it's still gonna generate the file. And what it's going to generate is um, classic partial file. There is not a full file in this EMIS extract. It's just pulling the partial. So I'm sure all of you guys used the partial file last you know, in classic last year, and then you used the SIS zone then to get the account and OPU information. It's the same thing here. So um, 
this, like I said, this extract, when I click on generate extract file, is going to create an actual file with the sequential file format, and that then just contains that partial data, just like it did in Classic. So they're going to use this extract file along, like I said, with the SIF agent when collecting the data in emis -R. Um, the auditor extract reports, and we'll, we'll talk about the data collector and stuff here in a little bit. Um, we used to have in Classic USAS Aud, and so this is basically the replacement for that. And what it is is a series of reports that we have out there already underneath um, their template reports, underneath the report manager. And so I have them labeled here which ones they are. So I just did a query on auditor and found the three reports, the account, the transaction, and the vendor. Um, I have another question here. This may be a question for someone else, but do we need to change the path for our SIF zone and the data collector for our districts on redesign? Um, yes, you, uh, I believe you will. Um, let me try to get some information on that. Um, I can't remember what um, had to be done last year, um, but I believe that, I think we have something out there documented on that and how it needs to point to a different direction. So let me find that. I should have included that in here, so my apologies. Um, so let me find that information and I will send that to you guys in a mass email. Thanks um, for reminding me about that, Mary. I'll write that down. Okay. Um, so yeah, once I get that and any other homework here um, <laughs> that you guys give me, I'll make sure I get that um, all taken care of and sent out in a, in a mass email to you guys. Um, when these reports are generated, um, and like I said, the Outer States Office will accept the CSV format and a cash summary, you can send those to this particular email. And that I have not heard if that's changed at all this year. If it does, I will let you guys know. But as far as I know, you can send all those as attachments to that email. That's what we did last year. Um, for those uh, districts that were on the first wave. Generating fiscal year end reports. A fiscal CD that we had in Classic is on the same JIRA issue that the monthly CD is on. So obviously when all of that information, you know, all of that gets in, put in place, they'll be, you know, capable of doing both monthly CD and fiscal CD. So unfortunately, those aren't going to be ready, um, so we will have to um, they'll have to run these manually um, using a fiscal year end date range for any of these that prompt for a date. So you will see a listing of all the different um, reports and things that we recommend that they run, and they can run as many more um, or less as they want. It's just our recommendation. And so I just have a listing of all of these on here. And then to close the fiscal year, um, obviously they're closing the month of June. So they close June and um, then they go in and if July hasn't been opened already, uh, maybe they opened it when they were doing their budgeting um, but if it isn't open already, they'll use the create option to create a new posting period, select uh, the month of July, enter in the calendar year, and if, um, to make July current, then at the same time they open it, they can check mark the current uh, box and click on create, and they are considered closed for the fiscal year. The financial data reporting, this is just a reminder slide as to where the information is coming from. So the SIF zone is going to have those cash budget and revenue counts and the operational unit codes, whereas the flat file is going to have um, the information underneath periodic and your capital asset information. <clears throat>
So districts only need to upload the sequential file from the EMIS extract um, along with their capital asset file in the financial data source. So when they're ready to run a collection in the data collector then, they will select the SIF agent and that financial data source folder. So once I get more information about the whole SIF zone with the redesign, like I said, I will send that information out to you guys. Um, and then the EMIS SOAP service configuration, again, um, is, is telling the SIF then, too, what to pull. So your count information from the history records um, or the current uh, count file information, so it knows 2019 is the information that I want. I do have down here, um, I got a, a message here. Oh, thank you. Um, Amanda sent a message out to everybody um, with that wiki page. I knew we had it documented somewhere. Um, you're going to, and it, it talks about this, the role. Um, I, yes, we do have an EMIS SIF role under, under, in USASR. Um, and then they're going to um, use that then. So she's got the link out here underneath the chat. And I will look at that stuff again and just do a, an explanation and send an email to you guys regarding that part. Can't believe I missed that. Um, OEE has a draft schedule posted out there for the 2019 period. Um, so I just have a little snippet of the financial collections. So um, it shows when they begin and um, when the supplemental period begins as well. Regarding the capital asset information, um, obviously redesigned districts are going to be using EIS and they can use the inventory extract and in importing into classic steps to extract their 19 data from the redesign to be uploaded into EIS, and then that just uploads it into the pending file. They still have to go in then and add the items the way they normally do in EIS, and then they're gonna follow our classic EIS closing procedures um, up through step three that generates the sequential file um, so that that can get pulled into the data collector as well. So before, um, well, I'll talk about, well, before we do that, let me, um, before we go into the next part, let me show you where that information is at. So if I go back to our listing here, I did um, include underneath here that inventory extract, and then I also included our classic PowerPoint and checklist for inventory, whether it's the SFE or EIS. But I want to talk about this extract a little bit more. So when I click on that, it takes me to our inventory extract and importing into Classic. So um, just a reminder that um, some of those post, one of those post import steps is to make sure once the district state is imported in, that their EIS Classic um, integration module has been installed, and that they also entered in their pending threshold amount and whether to extract both 500 or 600 object codes. So we've got a module that needs installed, as well as the configuration screen where they specify their pending threshold amount. So it's not their capitalization threshold, that's in classic, it's their pending threshold, and then whether they want both 500 and 600 or just 600 object codes. So what happens then is when they're invoicing um, through AP invoice, it, um, there is way off to the right on each line item, there is an EIS flag that um, gets set based off of what they've put into this configuration. And so if they've got an item, let's say their threshold amount is $500, and they just want anything with a 600 object code, it's what they set in the configuration, when they go into AP invoice, and they go invoice one of these PO items that's a 600 object code and over $500, they're gonna see an EIS field off to the right that should specify yes, um, because it's looking at that. And then once they post that invoice, it marks that or flags that uh, for inventory. And so what happens then is when they're ready to run an extract, and they can do this whenever, it's just a report, 
Um, but I would probably make sure that you keep track of the date um, of when they did it, um, the last time they ran it. So some districts may want to do this maybe at the end of every month when they're doing their month end closing, just to get in the habit maybe of running an extract. Um, but again, you might have different people running this than others in the treasurer's office that are doing this. Um, but in here, here's an example of the inventory extract report. So when I click on the generate report option, you'll see the parameters that are in here, my since date. So if I want to pull everything from January 1st, I could put that in here and it's going to find all of those items, those inventory items that were marked for inventory. It'll pull them in to this file, to the CSV file. And it's going to be in the correct format for it to get uploaded into a new program that we have available in EIS. So they can save the output file and name it whatever they want. They just don't want to be real wordy. Um, and then they have to file transfer it over just like they would any other file using some type of transfer utility program and making sure that the transfer type is ASCII. And then uh, when they log into Classic then, they're going to go into, an, um, at the menu prompt, type in the EIS IMPR program, and here's a screenshot of what that looks like. And so they're basically going to put in their import file that they created from redesign, and then um, execute this. And what that does then is it pulls all those items off of that CSV file and puts them on the pending file. So what I recommend they do after this is either run a 501 report or go into EIS screen into the pending option and confirm that those items are there. So now they're set in EIS and then they just move on then with making, creating inventory uh, tags for their pending items, everything that they need through the end of fiscal year 19. And then from there, they run our usual EIS closing procedures to close out for the fiscal year end. Uh, Non-EIS districts, um, they're going to be going in and entering in their information as they normally did um, last year. So they're not using EIS to get any information. They are going in and using whatever they are using to track their inventory um, and going into the EMIS FFE program and updating the information in there. And then again, it'll create an output file for them. And we covered this um, last week when we went through um, the classic steps. Um, it'll create a sequential file and then they're going to upload that into uh, the data collector. Uh, gap conversions. We do have a gap extract out there. So this is the web gap replacement. In Classic, we had underneath USA EXP, we had the gap EXP option. Um, so in the redesign, underneath extracts, we have a gap option in there. If I go back here, <clears throat> you'll see this gap option here. And so when you pull that up, it's just going to have um, the fiscal year, which obviously you'd be selecting 2019, and clicking on submit. And it's going to generate a gap export.txt file. So it's in that format, ready for it to be uploaded into WebGap. Now in Classic, I'm going to pull up Classic here. go in some of my test files here. In Classic, when I went into the GAP EXP option, um, it also had this option over here to export the file to send to the person that was responsible for uploading it in. So obviously, we don't have an option like that in the redesign. So what they're going to have to do is, you know, create this file and then attach it in an email to the person responsible for uploading the file into WebGap.
Okay, any questions? What I'd like to do is just bring up the checklist here, just so you can see that this is pretty much a replica of the um, PowerPoint that I just went over. So in here, we just have the steps. And like I said, um, you know, I, we may be still doing some tweaking here before the end of the fiscal year, um, but uh, it shows exactly the same steps that we just saw in the PowerPoint, pre-closing, month end, our reports, recommendations, the fiscal year end, options, all the uh, recommended fiscal year end reports, and then the post-closing steps down here, and just some notes about each of these. So um, it just talks about the EIS parts and the web gap information. Okay, I got over sooner than I thought, um, really, because there are some steps that are eliminated. It's, it's a cleaner. Um, I think checklist than it was in uh, classic. So any other questions? Uh, Michelle, I have a question. Um, on the uh, files that you send to the auditors, is there any issue with file size or do you need to zip them first so that they'll all, it'll be the right size to attach to an email? I don't remember having to zip them last year. Um, uh, but let me check on that for sure, Mary, to see. I don't think we had to last year. I think we just attached them. Um, and, but I'm wondering if we did. We must have done some type of secure email, though, to them. So let me look into that for sure, and I will include that in with the SIF information um, in an email to you guys. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, question here, does the EMIS extract create a complete data set? Uh, no. Um, as I specified before, it, like the full file, I think, I believe is what you're asking about. Um, it does not. It's just going to do um, the partial file. So I don't, I'm not aware of any full file that it's going to create. Okay, well, I'm going to hand it over um, to Lori. I'm going to make her the presenter, and, uh, and she'll get started then on the payroll steps. <clears throat> I'm going to change the role over to you, Lori. So. You should have that now. Okay, so let me go ahead and get my screen sharing going here. All right. And this one. Great. I gotta get it pulled up here. Come on. All right. Let me get my slideshow going here. All right, I think we're getting there. And yeah, let's there. Okay. All right. All right, everybody. Welcome to the payroll portion. Go ahead and get started here. Um, again, like Michelle said, last year we didn't really have a PowerPoint, uh, so this year we kind of created one to kind of go along with the checklist. And um, so kind of bear with me. I got, hopefully I got everything. I didn't miss anything. So we'll go ahead and start this. And if you have any questions, just feel free to ask. Go ahead and just unmute your phone and ask the question. That's fine. Um, so the first thing we're going to talk about is what we're going to be discussing today. Um, one thing you want to kind of remember to tell your districts is to please follow the, the checklist. And like, I, like Michelle has said, we have a checklist out there that we kind of set up. It's kind of generic, but you can use that 
to create your own checklist for your particular, you know, your particular districts. And so we always tell our districts, for the Nawaka districts, please follow the checklist. I mean, you're always going to get the one person that doesn't, they skip, but hopefully they listen and they follow the checklist because there's, you know, lines right out there that they can mark, yeah, I did this, yeah, I did that. So we just need to kind of stress to them, make sure you follow the checklist. Um, what we're going to be talking about today, is, like this is just the overview, we're going to be talking about, um, whoops, hold on, I went too far. Let me go back. <laughs> Goodness sakes, I'm really going crazy. Here we go. Um, we're going to be talking about life insurance premiums, uh, verif verification, like when the, pro when the payroll or the SRS advance is complete, um, running particular reports for the advance. Uh, creating new job calendars for the next school year, uh, EMIS staff reporting for the year end, and then new contracts for the next next school year, for the 1920 school year. First thing we'll talk about is that life insurance premium, which in classic used to be called the NC1 payment. We have the same options in the redesign. So if the district knows someone that's going to be leaving like as of the end of the fiscal year, they could go ahead and uh, process that employee with an NC1 payment or a life insurance payment through future or current, you know, if they want, if they use current, either way. Uh, the nice thing about the redesign is uh, you could, they can use adjustments and unlike classic where you know, if they forgot to add them in during, you know, say before June 30th and they left, um, if they forgot to add them in, they had to go in and do all this manual work. They had to go into like the federal record and the state record and add that NC1 payment information. So at the end of the year, at the end of the calendar year, it got included on the W-2 properly. In, in the redesign, they don't really need to do that because that life insurance, option is an adjustment as well, and when they use that adjustment option, it updates everything accordingly. So that's kind of a really, really nice thing. They don't have to worry about it quite as bad as they used to. And then if there's questions about the um, how to calculate the life insurance premium amounts, we have the uh, uh, publication 15B from the IRS. Here's the link for that uh, website. And then we have listed the pages that the, that information is located on. Um, here's just a screenshot of the redesign of the future screen and what your payment, the pay type would look like if they're adding it through future. And then it, we've got another screenshot of the current, payroll current. So if they were adding it through current, this is how they would enter it in there. And then we also have a screenshot here of the adjustments records. So again, they have kind of a few different options the way they can do it. Um, this would be your, your last option is your adjustments options. So they could go in and add it through adjustments if they choose. Um, one thing to keep in mind, nothing's changed, but I mean, it's the same as it's always been. Life insurance premiums um, are not they don't have federal, state, or, or school district taxes withheld. They, uh, they are added to the wages, so like if they do it in future or current, those, that amount that they're adding is actually going to be added to the employee's wages, but there's no tax withheld for federal, state, or school district. Medicare and FICA, however, are withheld from uh, life insurance payments, so they have to keep that in mind, and then if a city uh, tax with, uh, withholds, they want money withheld for uh, non-cash payments. They would have, the district would have to make sure that that's specified on the city uh, payroll item record. Uh, they have to make sure that that box is marked as true. And I'll show you that box, it's just a screenshot of what a city record looks like on the payroll item. And this tax non-cash earnings would have to be marked if that city basically taxes non-cash earnings. Um, one thing to keep in mind when you're processing the payroll, if, you're, if your 
uh, using the, the uh, future or current option and processing the, the NC1 or the life insurance premium payment through that. When you process, the life insurance amount is not included in, or is not in the total gross pay that's charged to USAS. So they got, the district has to keep that in mind. Um, but there are reports that, ha that list the information for non-cash payments on them that can be used for balancing. And that would be your pay report when you're processing your payroll. Your quarter report also has the, that non-cash uh, amount on there as well. Um, another thing that the district can do too, if they use the adjustments, if they want to create a report out of the adjustment screen, they could go in and they could filter, like on the adjustment screen, maybe for the type, which would be life insurance, and then maybe they only want to filter it for, you know, the calendar year or the fiscal year, whatever they want to filter. They could use the transaction date option and use the greater than or equal to sign, and maybe if they're doing it for the calendar year, they do greater than or equal to 1-1 one, one of 19. And then they could actually click the report option that's out there under adjustments, and they could actually create a report with the amount and everything that, is, that was uh, processed through adjustments uh, using or for the, uh, for the life insurance payment. And then if they wanted to, they could actually, you know, create the spreadsheet if they wanted to total up the dollar amount, they could just total that column using the auto sum option on the, um, Excel, in the Excel uh, program. And whoops, there was just a screenshot of like how you could set up the adjustment screen to process a report if you wanted to. So like I said, they would just uh, filter on the adjustment type, filter on the transaction date, then they would click that report option and create their report. Lori, this is uh, Carrie from HACA. I sure. have a quick question. I have a quick question because I'm I might have missed something, but or misunderstood, but you're saying that they either can enter it in payroll current or future, or they can do it as an adjustment? Yes, yes, so, there's three so, options. So the adjustment, would they then, that would almost be like the cleanup steps, like in classic when they missed it in processing Correct. it within a payroll, they would also have to like remit the appropriate taxes and everything if they do the adjustment option? Well, if they did the adjustment option, uh, they did the adjustment option, yes, because the only taxes that they would have to remit would be your Medicare or FICA, because that's all that's with, or city taxes possibly, if the city um, withholds on um, life insurance. But yeah, I mean, basically the adjustments is like your cleanup in classic when you're doing all those you know those those corrections to all the different deduction records you know like your federal your state your school district your medicare it's basically the cleanup it, it'll clean everything up all at one time but then you would, the district would still be responsible for the medicare or the fica tax on that particular life insurance premium everything else is going to be just like it is in classic you know it'll all come out on the w-2 at the year end and the additional does that tax, I think it does, but then the additional tax that they're responsible for on the adjustment, they would have to also adjustment when they're paying their payroll items, like when they're processing their equivalent of their pay debt, they would also have to enter an adjustment there or the adjustment yeah, they, Okay. Exactly. They have to actually probably make the adjustment to the amount withheld and you know, I mean, on the uh, adjustment screen for the like the six or the Medicare deduction, like the 692 or 693, whatever they're using, they would have to make an adjustment to that because normally, you know, like in classic, we normally say, okay, if you're do, if you forgot to do it, the Medicare or FICA has to be paid. Okay, uh, nine times out of ten, the school district just takes care of it because it's not usually a lot of money. But that's to say that they told the employee, okay, you've got to pay your portion. Okay, the employee paid their portion, the board has to pay their portion. They would have to go in and do an adjustment for that amount withheld or the board amount withheld to make sure that it balances correctly for the Medicare on the adjustment. Does that make sense? That does. Thank you for clarifying. Yep, no problem. No problem. Okay. Uh, the next the next thing that we're Lori, I have an additional question. 
Sure. So if you if you do this through adjustments, you're not just doing one adjustment um, for the life insurance. You also have to do an adjustment for the Medicare. Correct, because it's like I said, it's going to be just like classic. If you were making, if you for if they forgot to basically withhold, you know, withhold the non-cash payment, they would have to go in in classic and they would make all those changes to the federal, the state, the school district, the Medicare record. But then they had to basically pay the Medicare that was to be charged for that whatever was uh, whatever that non-cash payment was. So in theory, the board would pay it or the district and the employee pay it, but then they would have to go in and adjust the amount withheld because they actually paid the Medicare. So the same thing applies here in the redesign. They're going to have to go in. They would be making an adjustment for the life insurance payment. Then that that's done. Then that, that adjusts everything as far as like, like how much was paid for life insurance. But there's nothing that as far as the Medicare that's showing the withholding. So they would have to go into adjustments and do a, a amount withheld for the Medicare record and however much was paid, you know, the board payment and the employee payment. They would have to make those adjustments on the adjustment screen to that particular payroll item, whether it be Medicare or FICA or whatever. So in reality, they're still better off not forgetting <laughs> while they're processing payroll, but if they do, there's you know it's a little bit easier than it used to be in classic where they had to go in and update all those deduction records. Now they don't. All they have to do is update using the uh, life insurance premium, and then they'll just have to make sure that they pay the Medicare amount that's that's to be be paid on that life insurance premium. Does that okay. make sense, okay. Bonnie? Yes, it did. Um, I still okay. have one additional question. Um, if you run this through payroll, through for future or current, does it still pull over into adjustments? Like, does it put it adjustment in the adjustment grid automatically? I don't believe it does. I don't believe it does. Okay. I mean, if you're running it through payroll, it's not going to put it in adjustments. No, it would be okay. ran through the payroll, so it's not going to be an adjustment. Yep, no problem. Okay, so the next thing that the district can do, they could actually do it right now, just like they could in Classic. They could actually go in and start running some of the reports and start ver you know, verifying and making sure you know, employees are showing up on the advance. I am having an awful time with this. Hold on here, I gotta get back, there we go. Um, so what they can do is they could go out to the reports option and then go down to the SRS advance and there's the, the particular reports. Now, like in, in Classic, they would just run the STRS Advance. It would create all three reports. It would create the STRS, a STRS report, the STRS Advance, I'm sorry, the STRS Advance report, the STRS, STRS Advance tax report, and the non-advance tax report. Okay, in the redesign, you, they have to choose the, the, the options three different times. So let me just get out of here real quick, and I'll go out to the redesigns just so you can see what I'm talking about. All right, so if they went to report, oh, of course, my, my session is going to expire. Oh, uh, let's see. Okay, so they go to report, they go to the STRS advance option, and down here, you can see there's three different buttons. They have to process three different times, okay? So this down to rate advanced fiscal year to date report, that is similar to the SRS advanced report in classic. The generate advanced positions report is like their their SRS AD text report. And then not this generate non advanced positions report is like the non advanced tech report in classic. So again, they would have to go in, put in their uh, starting date for the academic year and the ending date for the academic year. Then they're going to go in and they would generate this the, the report uh, for, the, for basically everyone, everyone that paid into STRS for the entire fiscal year. That's what all everybody that's going to show up on this report. 
then they're going to generate the advanced position report, which will only show any employee that's going to be advancing. So they're going to go ahead and process that. And then they'll process the non-advanced report to see anybody that will not be advancing. All right, I'm going to go back to my PowerPoint here. Uh oh, I didn't want to do that. Oops. Oh, here's, you know what, we, I totally skipped over this after we were talking about things, I skipped over this, but um, under the system menu option, there's a SRS advanced configuration screen. So anyone that had a district that used um, the redesign last fiscal year that basically reported their advanced employees through uh, the redesign, they would want to go out and look at this advanced um, configuration screen because there's three different fields in here, an advanced amount field, there's an advanced mode, and an advanced paid back field. And the, the nice thing about this is, unlike in classic, okay, when you're processing in classic, if you had an amount sitting out there, obviously from the prior fiscal year, it was never taken out. So normally when that happens, corrections need to be filed with SCRS once you figure out who the employee or employees are. And then normally the ITC would go out and they would clear that amount out of the advance amount field. So the, the next year they were good to go as far as like their advance. What will happen is when your district is processing for this fiscal year, if, okay, let's just say that there, that advance amount field, there was something sitting out there from last year, but the district basically corrected it. And for some reason or another, the amount never got cleared out of that advance amount field. What'll happen when they process for the advance for this next fiscal year, that amount in reality gets blanked out and then the new dollar amount for the new fiscal year is the only thing that will, will be on that advance amount field. It's not going to add that amount that's sitting out there. It will only put in the amount that is for the, the current fiscal year. So that's kind of a nice thing if, if, this, if you would forget, you know, like I said, either the ITC would go out and clear it or the district could go out and clear it if they have the capability of, of seeing the configuration screen. Um, so that's one thing to keep in mind that even if there is an amount sitting here, maybe it's, it, it was, you know, forgotten to take, be removed, it's not going to affect anything with the current fiscal year that you're going to be processing. That, that amount will not be included. The amount that's going to be on there is only for the new fiscal year. Okay. Um, so we've talked about the advanced positions report, the non-advanced positions report, and then your uh, advanced fiscal year to date report. Another thing the districts could do right now, or maybe they've already started doing it, is they can be adding the job calendars for the 1920 school year. So they, as soon as they have the, the calendar from the board, they can be out there adding those calendars in. Um, they're going to go in using the core option, and then there's a job calendar option. They're going to choose that. And then what we would suggest, just like we do in Classic, is we suggest just creating one calendar with work days and holidays. And then after they've done that, there's a copy feature that they can actually take that one calendar that they created and then copy it over to all other calendars. And then once they've done that, then they can just go into the individual calendars and tweak them because obviously you have some calendars that have more work days than others, some have different, you know, weeks off, whatever. They can tweak that to make those calendars correct. And then we do have that job calendar report option out under the reports menu, so the districts could go out and print off job calendars if they needed to. And then one other feature, or one other thing you want to remind your district is to create a default calendar for the new school year. So basically they're going to go in, create that default calendar for the, you know, for the year, for the fiscal year, and just make sure that they save it. That way when they're processing payroll, that calendar is up there as well as all the other calendars. 
Okay. Um, the EMIS staff data, again, if you had districts that used the redesign last year and have not cleared out the long-term illness data from last year, they're going to want to go ahead and get that done right now. And the way they can do that is they could go to the, uh, the core option, go to employees, and then on the grid, they can actually pull up um, under state reporting, there's a, the long-term illness field, and they could filter on the grid for any long-term illnesses that are greater than or equal to one. When they do that, any employees that have data on the long-term illness field that's greater than or equal to one should show up on the screen. When those employees are there on the screen, then you could use your mass change option on the employee screen. And you could click that button, and then there's a definition already created called Clear Employees Long-Term Illness. You could go out and select that definition, and then uh, well, actually then click the execution mode, and then when you do that, you'll see that the, uh, the option for clear, clear employees long-term illness is there in, when you're in execution mode, and then all you need to do is cl click on the submit mass change button. When you do that, all those employees that have long-term illness days should then be changed to no days. It should be zero. And then what the district want to make sure that they do for the fiscal year 1819, they're going to want to make sure if they have any employees that have long-term illness days for this fiscal year, that they go in and actually enter in the, the, uh, the amount on that long-term illness field on the employee record for this fiscal year. Another thing that the district can be doing is creating the new contracts for the, for the 1920 school year. And um, when they do that, they, they'll just go to the processing tab, and under that processing tab, we have new contracts. And there's several different options that they have a, a choice of using. We have the new contract maintenance option, which is like the main option, main option in Classic. Then we have a mass copy compensation option, which is like the build feature in Classic. Or if they want to use an import like a CSV file, we have an import new contracts option, which is similar to the import feature in new contract. So they're going to go ahead and get those new contracts created, uh, making their adjustments. If they're using, if they're using that maintenance or the uh, mass copy option, they're going to be basically going in and doing you know, their adjustments, making uh, adjustments for the new fiscal year for the contracts. And then the nice thing about that is with the redesign, like in the past it was classic, they had to wait. You know, we have to wait until the, the contract start date is inclusive of the period beginning and ending date of a pay. That is not the case anymore with redesign. Once they have those new contracts out there, they could actually go out and activate every single one of them because all of those compensation or new contract records will have a compensation start date and a compensation stop date, meaning that they will not actually start getting paid on until that contract start date comes into play when they're processing a payroll. So super nice because that record will just basically sit out there under the compensations until it's time to start paying it. Um, Let's see, where are we at here? Hey, Lori. Oh, another, yes, yes. I'm sorry. Hey, could you give us the relationships again to the start sure. and stop date on, sure. on the yep. compensation records in relationship to the initialization period? So, yeah, say, okay, so what you're, you're talking about new contracts, right? Yeah, new contract. Yeah, if you can give us the date relationships between the start and stop dates as the relationships to the uh, initialization begin and end date, how that all ties okay. together. Thank okay, so, ba so basically, all right, right now they have a, a compensation record that's sitting out there and possibly the, uh, the compensation stop date on that record, let's just say it's 630 of 19, okay? So if they had new contracts created right now 
for, for everybody that has a July 1 contract start date. They could actually create those new contracts and then they could actually activate them. They could activate them, which will actually pull them over into the compensation record, okay? So at that point, the employee has the old compensation record, which ends on 630, and they have the new compensation record that starts on 71, all right? So let's just say you have a payroll that runs from six, let's do, 25 through 7, 3, okay? What it's going to do, it's going to pull, it's going to pull everything from that old record that's sitting out there that has an ending date of 630. So it's going to pay off that compensation record. And then if there's any work days on the calendar from 7, 1 to 7, 3, it's going to actually start paying on the new compensation record. So basically, maybe they have one day. They're going to get paid for the one day on that new, new compensation record and probably be getting paid off on their old compensation record. Does that help, Heidi? Does that make it a little bit easier to understand? Yeah, so it's yeah, so it would look like a double payment, a double per pay amount payment, right? Or per pay. Right, but yeah, but and the thing is, though, yeah, and the thing about it is, though, they're only, you know, they would only be getting paid for probably, it would be like a last pay on the old job. And then it's possible that everything from seven, you know, on the seven three might be all just being thrown into a crude because there's maybe there's no days, you know what I mean? So it's just yep. all going into a crew, but yeah, yeah. Yes. So no, basically, can, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. Go ahead. Oh, you're fine. Go ahead. I was see. So districts that are still, we have some districts that um, still like use an end date of 6:30 instead of like they change their uh, periods during the summer to accommodate days and service days and everything. So if mm -hmm. say they're doing it, say they wouldn't have a cutoff until 7:3. But for these certain pay groups, they're going to cut them off in June 30th. They can still use that ad pay group stuff. And if that's the case, it's still paying off the original job, but leaving that new compensation record out there until it's picked up yes. seeing the calendar days, correct? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Yeah, because like I, it's basically if, if that, that compensation start date is inclusive of, you know, your payroll dates, then it's going to get pulled in, just like it does in classic. You know what I mean? Like if you have, if you, because if a district uh, purged in their new contracts too early, and basically that beginning date was inclusive of, of you know, or not inclusive of your period beginning and ending dates, it's going to actually pull it in, which maybe they didn't want it to. But yes, in here, I think you you should be okay because um, let's just say that your period beginning and ending dates run from 6.25 to 7.2, okay? That means basically even though they have that new compensation record out there, nothing's going to happen to it. It's going to sit there till the next payroll. You know, nothing, unless, nothing's unless good. They have, unless they have work days on the calendar, right? Um, no, I mean, it's not going to do anything with that new compensation record until that compensation start date is included in your period beginning and ending dates. Okay, that, that, that was the key. That was what we were looking for. Okay, yeah. thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. No problem. Okay. Lori, uh, uh -huh. Lori, this is Missy at Omarisa. I have a quick question for you, too, on new sure. contract. Sure. Um, my question is, if you have, um, if you purge your new contract, say for starting July 1st, and then you need to do a staff collection for the last school year, you know how you had to have your information in the EMIS, the uh, last year's information in the EMIS fields? Yes. In Classic. Well, how will that work in redesign? Is the system smart enough to know to pull it if it's called legacy then? Um. I'm trying to remember if if we talked about that. 
because obviously we don't have USPMX in the redesign, you know, because that's what we used we used before too. We tell them, you know, run that and create a file, then you could just use that file. Um, but I know what you're saying. So basically, they would almost have to have. They would all, you know how you have your EMIS contract fields out on the job screen in Classic right now? Yeah. Okay. We have the uh, those same fields on the position record. I'm thinking we would almost have to have data in those fields in order to pull in the correct amount. Because like you said, if you have July 1st contracts and the EMIS reporting, I don't think or the staff collection isn't. The last date right now is of eight is eight nine, so right. obviously those employees are going to have to have. I think they're going to have to have that data in the MIS contract field on the position record, so it pulls in that data from you know for the fiscal year nineteen. Um, I'm hey, trying Lori, to think. Yeah, is, Lori Knight, there's the configure MIS configuration year um, that's set. So if you don't change that to 2020, then that that, is helps so cool. determine, that helps determine which records get pulled in to the data collector. That's right. I forgot about that. So that's under the system configuration. Let me, yeah. let me go out real quick and I'll show them. I totally forgot about that. So, yeah, Missy, we don't have to worry about that. But <laughs> thank you, Perfect. Lori. Perfect. That makes me feel so much better. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, so basically under system and then configuration, I think there's that EMIS, da, 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 where are you, right here, reporting configuration screen, right here. So this this test district I'm in is still in fiscal year 18. So until, you know, after EMIS reporting is done, your staff collection is done, you, that's not going to, you don't, aren't going to want to change that until that time. So, I mean, we're going to leave that at 2019 until all of the staff data is done because with ODE, it's hard to tell. They might say, oh, well, we're going to extend it till September. You know, as long as we leave that, that configuration screen alone, it's not going to pull anything new for the employees. It'll pull the old data. So, yeah, we should be good with that. So, Lori, we can then still do SIF if we need to on the staff collection until the time that we change the EMIS reporting year. Correct, correct, because, yes, because we don't have anything like USPMX anymore in the redesign. Okay. You know, because okay. like in classic, we had to create the USPMX file, you know, right. just in case right. they needed changes, and then we could make a change to that, and then they could load that into the MIS FFE. Don't need to do that anymore. So, yeah. And, and so they should be able to pull that from the data collector since if that fiscal year is still marked as 2019. They should still get okay. the data from 2019. Okay. And this will be a manual modification we will have to do every year um, between when the previous collection year closes and when the next collection year starts. Correct. Correct. You know what? I'm going to have to add that. I'm going to have to add that to the... I'll add it to the PowerPoint, and I'll add it to the checklist, too, because, I mean, the checklist is, is kind of for you guys to go ahead and, and, you know, tweak it as you want. I don't think that the districts will probably be changing. I would probably, they could, I guess, if they have access to the configuration screen, but I would guess that after, after the EMIS reporting is complete, then the ITC or the district will want to go in and make sure that that's changed to 2020. But okay. I guess we probably, we should add that to the checklist. I'm going to write that down because that's okay. something that we want. Actually, I don't even know what, I'll put it right at the end because in reality, you're not going to really want to do anything with it until the staff data collection is done. So let me write that down. Okay, yeah. I'll in regards to, to that, in regards to the fiscal year on the staff EMS configuration, mm -hmm. does that look at the comp compensation start and stop dates, or how does it know what compensation to pull in? I think it does because 
because you're like your 18, 18, 19 compensations that report to EIS flag is still going to be marked. And so it's going to be looking at those start and stop dates for 18, 19 because this is set to fiscal year 19. It's going to be looking at those records, not the current record. So yes, it should be looking so at those we, start and stop dates. So we currently have on those compensation records as a report to EMIS checked. Um, yes. Once we're done with this fiscal year, we don't need to go back in and uncheck when we're done reporting because when well, we go into yes. 2020, it will then read right. those date ranges. It's supposed to. That's one thing I do want to double check with our programmer because I know we had an issue with the old ones not getting unchecked, you know, after the fiscal year, after that fiscal year was done. So I'm going to double check with the programmer on that because I know last year, I think it was Omarisa, they had an issue because when they started doing their staff collection for the first window of the new fiscal year, it was pulling it, the records in two records. It was pulling that old record in as well as the new compensation Lord, record. Lord, so I'm going to double check. It's Ms. Ida Maurice, and yes, that is correct. It was pulling in both records, and we had to go and, and uncheck the old record. Uncheck them. Yeah, and that's what I want to, I want, because I was thinking that, I talked, I remember talking to Andy about this, and I thought he said something about that was supposed to be getting unchecked. So, you know, on its own, if it doesn't, if it doesn't, then we may have to do something to uh, uncheck it on the compensation record, possibly like filter, you know, um, maybe if you have 1819 as a description, you have to filter everything for 1819 and then un unflag mm -hmm. that, that record. So I'll double check hey, with the programmer. Yeah, this is Lori again. I did, did EMIS training um, staff reporting like end of year, beginning of year with our districts and so I had talked to Andy about this, and you do have to uncheck those. It does not use the stop date at all because of the overlap in time um, with like August, the closing of this fiscal year being August 9th. There's, and because of the way some positions, compensations have to report, be reported once through a reporting cycle there was no way for them to use the stop date. It strictly uses the start date. So you do okay. have to go in and set all of those prior year contracts, mm -hmm. those to not be reportable. Okay, so basically you, sounds like you are gonna have to do it manually. So you're gonna have to go into the compensation records and hopefully, you have a description listing or a label listing like 1819 and then you can easily filter those records and then you'll have to change that EMIS flag to basically uncheck it so so false or use so, the compensation stop date like cuz those would all be last year so you could use that as well as you don't use the that's label true yeah that's true too so either one, so the SAP date or the description label to filter. Yeah. Lori, is, is it possible, Lori, for you to add that on the checklist too when yep. you're adding yep. this year? Because I, I it's will. A help, huge help of a reminder for us. Exactly, exactly. Because if you don't and you run your first collection for the new fiscal, you're going to be like, oh, they're, super, they're coming on here twice. So I will uh, uncheck EMIS flag. Okay. So thinking yep, of creating new con so thinking of creating new contracts, you're not going to want to mark those as reportable to EMIS, right? When you, depending on when you activate them, if you have yeah, contracts you'll, starting you'll, you'll, on you'll, seven one, you're not going to want to mark those as report to EMIS because this will get pulled into your no collection. no it will, no it it shouldn't it shouldn't get pulled into the collection because of the start date being seven one. I mean, your your fiscal year is only going through 630, so it's going to only pull in everything up to 630 of 19. Anything 7-1 of 19 through 630 of 20 is going to be for fiscal year 20. So you can definitely still keep them marked as report to EMIS. 
because one way or the other, or the other, you're going to have to change that flag. If you don't mark them as report to MIS now, then you'd have to go back in later and actually do double work. You'd have to unflag the old ones and then flag the new ones. So you're better off just having them all flagged and then just unflagging the old ones after the MIS reporting has been finished. Make sense? Kind of. Lori, is there a mass change option for this? A mass change option for the the flag for the EMIS flag? Yes. Um, I don't think we have one out there right now. Maybe we can create one. I'll see if we can create one and put that definition out there. If we can do it, that way it'd be a lot easier. That way we already got it set, and then all you'd have to do is filter your employees and then run it. Let me uh, let me write that down and see I'm if we can do a change definition for EMIS flag. Okay. Yep. Go ahead. Uh, this is Deb. Um, does that mean that for the new contracts through uh, July and August uh, that the compensations would have to be unflagged? No, I would keep them flagged. I would keep all the, any new contracts, just leave them flagged as, as re, EMIS reportable. Just leave them flagged. And then all you would have to do then is run, either go in and we'll, hopefully we can create a definition to unflag the EMIS, report to EMIS field. And then you would only be doing that for the people or for the, con, the compensation records for 19 to, or for 18-19. And then your new contract or new compensation records are fine. They're all set with EMIS reportable, and we don't have to do anything with those. Does that make sense, Deb? Uh, I, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm just, what I'm what I'm basically saying is okay. If you're the old compensation records are already out there, okay? That's getting reported to EMIS clear through till August 9th or beyond, who knows? But in the meantime, you're, you need to activate the new compensation record, okay? There's no reason not to have the report to EMIS like set on that record because it's not going to get pulled in to the collection for 18-19 for because of the, the uh, start date. And then there's no reason not to have it checked because if you if you don't, then you're going to have double the work with going in and unflagging the old ones and then flagging the new ones. You might as well just have them flagged, and then all you have to take care of is unflagging those old uh, old old compensation records. It makes it a little bit easier than having to try to flag and unflag. We'll just unflag the old records after this year has been completed. Does that help hey, at all? Hey, Lori. Yes. Hey, Lori, this is John with HCC. So I'm just making sure that I understand correctly. The reason that it w that the new contracts in fiscal year 20 would not pull in is because of the EMIS configuration under um, the system configuration screen. Correct. Correct, because that's okay. still going to be set as 2019. And so 2019 fiscal year is running from 7-1 of 18 through 6-30 of 19. So that's all it's going to be pulling in. It's not going it shouldn't be pulling in anything from uh, the new compensation for the 7-1 of 19. It shouldn't be pulling anything in from that. Gotcha. All right, thank you. Okay, you're welcome. All right. Um, all right. So we will go back to the slides here. Um, another another option. Well, go ahead. Um, before we leave new contracts, which it looks like you're still going to talk about it a little, but I just mm -hmm. wanted to clarify one question before. I think I'm not understanding. If you have, for instance, a 260-day staff that works through June 30 and starts their new contract on July 1st, and you mm -hmm. have a pay date on July 5th that covers days from both the old mm -hmm. and some from the new, but it's mm -hmm. supposed to be the last pay on the old, can mm -hmm. you activate that new year contract before that pay on the old 
and have it only pay on the old and give days to the new but not pay on the new like you could in classic or would it pay on both the old and the new I think the way it's I think the way it's set up <clears throat> excuse me Carrie is because I I remember we had this discussion because I think initially when we first started we had problems with that because it was actually paying on the new and we didn't really want it to. All we wanted it to do was give them the days from the new. You know how in classic all it would do it would pay everything on the old contract but only give the days from the new and then maybe put, you know, the amount in the accrued field for for those days. And that's basically what it should be doing now in the redesign. And we talked about that with the programmers at one time because initially I don't think it was doing that, but it should be doing it now. So in reality, what you're saying is what it should be doing. It should be paying the old contract off and then any days that are in the new contract would get counted on the compensation as days as days work or day you know, work days or days worked. And then any amount that would have been paid for that should go in the accrued field because obviously they shouldn't be getting paid. They wouldn't be getting paid on that, would only be uh, taking that money and putting it in accrued, accrued to, to basically pay them f throughout the remainder of the year. Does that help, Terry? That, that does. I just wanted to clarify that because I didn't know if it yeah. sounded like that was the case. I thought somebody said there would be a double payment, so. No, there shouldn't be. There shouldn't. No, I, if, if, I, if I said that, I'm sorry. I'm incorrect on that because in, initially I think it was doing that where it was actually paying for those particular days, but it, it, that was when we first started with the redesign. But now it should not be doing that. It should be paying off the old contract and then any days on the new contract should be getting counted, but then any monies for that would be going into accrued. It should be doing the same behavior as Classic did, and that's what Classic would have done. Okay, thank you. Yep. Okay, so another option that we have now in the redesign is we have a feature that you can actually uh, create non-contract compensation records. So like all of your subs or your supplementals, you can actually create those records and just load them basically right into the compensation screen. So we have a report out there that you can go to. So let's go to the reports and then the report manager. And we have an SSDT non-contract compensation mass load extract feature. If you process that, it creates that, uh, it creates it in spreadsheet format. It's like a, the data fields. So like the headers of the fields are already listed on the, the, the file. So what the district can do is they can go in and update, you know, maybe there's update to the or the amounts or, you know, the hourly rate or whatever. They can go in and make the changes to that information and then they're going to save that file as a CSV file. And then all they would need to do is go under uh, utilities and then go to the mass load feature. And when they do that, they can uh, choose the non-contract compensation entity and then they would choose their file wherever they have their files saved as at. And then under the importable entities, uh, they'll choose that non-contract compensations and then all they have to do is click the load feature and then it will actually take that spreadsheet and load all of that information into the compensation or the non-contract compensation record for the employee. Um, then we have our month end closing. So again, this, the districts are used to this by now. They're going in and processing their SERS per pay report. So they go to report, they go to SERS per pay, and then they just want to verify um, the data. They process the generate report button so they can create a report to verify the days and uh, hours, et cetera. And then um, when everything is correct, they could go in and create the submission file. But another thing they want to make sure is they want to make sure that all their total contributions equal their total deductions and the, the warrant checks payable to SERS. So they want to make sure that their earnings times a 10% equals the contributions. So we want to make sure of that and then we want to make sure that the monies that we 
that we submitted to SERS matches what we have listed for balancing purposes. We want to make sure we balance. And then if to, for them to create their SERS tape file, they just have to go back under that as the reports, SERS report, and then they're going to click that generate submission file. And then they can save that file to their folder or a desktop or wherever they want to save it. And then they'll go in and upload that file to the ESERS website. We have month on uh, closing. We have a couple little features here that they're going to process. Again, they probably are already doing this every month, but they can go in um, to payment and go to the check register and they could reconcile manually or they can use the auto reconcile checks option if they have that feature set up. And then they'll want to run um, a report Either they can go to reports and run uh, reports and go to report manager and they can run that SSAT outstanding checks report or we also have under reports a report called reports payment, reports payment, I can't say it, report, or, I'm sorry, <laughs> I can't get this right, payment transaction status report. So under reports there's a report called payment transaction status report and they can actually find any outstanding payment. Um, on that report as well. So they have the, the, the option of choosing one or the other. And they're going to obviously balance their payroll account just like they do every any other month. And then if they want to uh, do the benefit accrual, so if they accrue uh, leave every month, they're going to want to make sure that they go ahead and uh, process that through uh, the processing tab and then the, the benefit update and projection feature so they can uh, process leave accruals. Then we have quarter end closing. So we have a quarter report underneath the reports tab. And that is going to give them a, li a list of all the quarters to date figures that, that come from the historical payroll and any adjustments for the quarter that were made in the adjustment screen. So that's where that data is coming from on the quarter report. Uh, they're going to want to compare the total of outstanding payable checks that were written for the quarter to the totals of each payroll item code on that quarter report to verify that everything is accurate and it is balanced. Uh, they're going to want to kind of just keep in mind if they have any payroll items that are combined by payee, they want to make sure that they kind of, you know, are heads up on that. And then any differences that they find, they need to make a resolution. They need to resolve it, whether they can figure it out themselves. Maybe they need to contact the ITC to help them. They have to figure out, you know, what the, why there's a problem, why there's a difference. They're going to also compare that total gross that's listed on the report with all the payroll clearance checks that were written from USAS. And if there were any voided checks during the quarter, they're going to subtract the growth from the payroll clearance checks that were written. They're going to subtract that amount. And this is just a screenshot of uh, like the total summary on the quarter report, what it looks like. Um, another thing they're going to want to do is balance that calculated adjusted growth on the quarter report. So the total gross minus the total annuities plus the non-cash earnings should equal the calculated adjustable, adjustable gross. Um, if, it, if the figure is off, if, it does, if it's not correct, there's some things that they can do. They can uh, verify the total annuities equal the total of the outstanding payable amounts made to the annuity companies. Uh, they can go to the report, report manager and then they can generate an audit Auditable, auditable event report and see if maybe there were any manual changes made to like total gross, applicable gross, um, payroll item annuities, federal applicable gross, and then another thing that they can do is verify their non-cash payments as well. Oops, boy, I'm just having a heck of a time here. There we go. And then again, there's just a screenshot of that report. Um, another thing they're going to want to do is process W-2 uh, report and submission. They're going to want to go in and go under reports 
and process that report. Again, just like they are doing in Classic, we want to make sure we're kind of being proactive and not getting errors or anything, kind of keeping up on it before the end of the year, and then we have a, a trillion errors. They can actually go in and process this right now, making sure that everything is accurate, no errors are showing up. And then they're going to want to balance that W-2 report, again, to make sure that there's not too many, not any problems at the calendar year end. Um, they're going to balance the payroll item total for taxes, the payroll item totals for the annuities, and then there's a W-2 reconciliation sheet that they have, that we have sitting out there. Usually they have that for a year end time. We have that sitting out there on our, um, on the SSDT wiki. They can actually go in and print it off if they wanted to, but they can use that to make sure that they're balancing. All right, um, the next thing that they're going to want to do, just like we did in Classic, they would go in and run pay dead um, and make sure that there wasn't, weren't no outstanding deductions thing out there. In redesign, they're going to go in and they're going to go to the processing tab and go to the process outstanding payables option. And then when they go to that option, they really shouldn't see anything on the screen. There should be no outstanding payables listed. But I would t uh, suggest to them to just click on the payable report and select all the payroll items just to verify that there's no outstanding payable sitting out there. And again, normally there shouldn't be any outstanding uh, payable sitting out there at the end of the quarter. Uh, another thing that we uh, usually would need to do at the quarter end is running the ODGFS report. So again, they can go to the reports, go to ODGFS report. On that report, they're going to want to make sure that they verify the weeks and the, the totals. And then just kind of remind your district too, a lot of times people forget this, but the taxable wages that are on the report are used for co contributing employers. Uh, and they're calculated a value based on the ODGFS rules. So once they meet that threshold, I, I can't remember how much it is, $5,000, $6,000. Then on that report, it's gonna, it'll probably just show zero for that employee because they've met that threshold. And a lot of times people get kind of freaked out. They're like, it's not listing anything. And that's the reason is because of that employer is a contributing employer. So it basically, once, they, once an employee meets the threshold, it does not show anything on that taxable wages field. Um, once the district goes through, verifies the hours and, and or weeks, I should say not hours, <laughs> verifies the weeks and everything looks accurate, they're going to go back into that OEGFS report and then they're going to click on that generate submission file. They're going to save that file to a desktop or a folder wherever they're saving it and then they need to send it securely to, the, to you guys at the ITC so you can combine it for submission. And you've been doing this all along, but again, this is just kind of a reminder for the districts because usually there's so much going on, you know, fiscal year end, you don't want to forget a step. So that's just something we just kind of like to remind them and tell them, hey, don't forget to do this. Um, after all the June pays are, are completed, um, if, if the district knows of any like early contract payoffs, so maybe you have somebody that's going to be leaving, they could actually go out and change the number of pays in the contract on the compensation record and just kind of give them a heads up. If they do that, the paper period will probably get changed just so they're aware of that. But again, maybe they have somebody that's leaving, they're not going to pay them through advance or whatever. Um, they're going to pay them like one time after, you know, the, the advance has started and maybe they're in advance, it's just going to pay them off one time. They can do that by going in and changing that number of pays in the contract by one. <clears throat> then they can actually go in and again, they can process the SCRS reports. They can do the um, advanced fiscal year to date report, which is your SCRS ID report, your advanced positions report, which is your SCRS ID tax report, and then your non-advanced position report, which is your non-advanced uh, non report. Uh, the, uh, and this just kind of explains it, that the uh, advanced fiscal year to date report, what it selects, it, it, it pulls in all the employees and any jobs that were subject to SCRS withholding for the entire fiscal year. 
So all employees that had any amounts paid during that fiscal year would be listed on the report. So even you know anybody that's not advancing, you had subs or whatever, anybody's going to be listed on this report that paid into SCRS. And then the service credit that's appearing on this report is based on the STRS decision tree. So if there's questions on somebody, you may have to go out and look at that decision tree and kind of follow it and see, yeah, if it's processing it correctly. And we, I do have the STRS decision tree um, out there on the wiki. I have a um, link that are put out there so you guys can look at that. Oops. Darn it. Um, it's same as in classic. The parameters for the jobs to advance basically are if the work days equal to the days worked, the job's going to advance. If the amount remaining to pay, to pay is greater than zero, zero, the job is going to advance. If the pays greater than the pays paid, the job is going to advance. Um, so if that's the case. They're going to have accrued wages or contribution amounts that will be calculated for them for each employee for the advance. The amount that's accrued is going to be the amount of the earnings that have not been paid to the employees. They basically earn them, but they haven't been paid yet, times the employee's SRS withholding rate. And then on this next screen, if it comes up, come on. We're telling you that the accrued contributions is calculated using the paper period from the compensation record for the remaining pays minus one, then the last pay calculation occurs. And on this screen here, this gives you like a breakdown of how it actually is calculating the, the payments for the advance. Okay, so the advanced positions report, which is, again, like your STRSAD text report in Classic, it's going to give you all the employees that are to be advanced, everybody that has accrued contributions. Um, to keep in mind that it, there are a possibility that those contributions could be inflated if that increased compensation flag is, is checked on the 450 record and the 691 uh, record has an inflated rate, so just keep it. So basically, your pickup employees are probably going to have um, inflated compensation amounts. Um, they're going to want to make sure that they look at this report really carefully, make sure that everything looks accurate, and they want to be consistent with the prior year. So be, basically, meaning if John Smith was in advance last year, we may want him to be in advance this year. Um, a lot of times, you know, you know, you sometimes like superintendents or something, they don't advance. Well, all of a sudden he's advancing. We don't want him advancing, so we got to look at him and see why is all of a sudden he advancing. So we just want to be consistent with prior years. And then they also want to make sure that they check their supplemental contracts because a lot of times supplementals get missed. You know, if they're paying them um, stretch throughout the whole year, we want to make sure that if that's the case, that they get included on the advance if they should be. want to make sure of the, of the of, that they get, you know, paid throughout the advance, throughout the summer months. And then your non-advanced employees, your non-advanced position report, uh, it's going to list any jobs that will not be advancing. Uh, and some criteria is if the job has no amounts remaining to pay, but it meets all other criteria, they're going to be on this non-advance report. If the day's work plus remaining days from the calendar through June 30th exceed the total work days, they're going to be on the non-advance report. And keep in mind and tell your districts, this report isn't a catch-all. They got to, you know, kind of verify and make sure, um, but they want to make sure that they're looking at everybody because they don't want to miss somebody, you know, whether they should be advancing or not advancing. They got to make sure that they're diligent on keeping track of everybody. Um, and again, your advanced uh, fiscal year to date report is the complete report of everybody from for STRS, everybody that contributed, everybody that got paid throughout the fiscal year. Uh, they're going to want to go in and make and verify those service credits on the report. Want to make sure that everything looks accurate. Um, any any employee that had 120 days of service is going to get 100% credit 
uh, employees that have less than 120 days of, of service, the credit basically is based upon the, the decision tree. Um, if you have employees that are classified as part-time, uh, they have service credit, there's a part-time or full or part-time flag on the 450 record that you have to make sure that that's set <coughs> to, the correct, um, to the correct option. And then if a, if a district isn't certain if an employee's part-time or full-time, they would have to talk to STRS to get a better fair clarification of that. Um, any re-employed uh, re retirees are always going to have 0% credit reported with their contributions. Uh, the calculated service credit for retired retirees will flag a warning just in case you just want to make sure if you get a warning for a rehired retiree, it's not uncommon for that to happen. Um, any staff that retires and then rehires in the same fiscal year is probably going to appear twice on the report. One line would be for the contributions prior to retirement and the other line is uh, when they were actually a rehired retiree. Um, the, on the advanced fiscal year to date report or the SCRSID report, uh, they want to balance the amount that's showing on the deposit pickup column that's on that report. Um, it should total the outstanding payable checks already written to STRS plus the USAS check that were written for any pickup amounts that were paid. Um, if they can't balance and they can't resolve the problem, again, they need to contact their ITC first. Maybe we can help them. If we can't help them, we're probably going to have to refer them to STRS. Normally, STRS can find the problem. Um, and then just so they know that STRS balances their, their records by employees as well as by district. Uh, once all of the STRS advance information is correct, they feel it's correct on the reports and everything, they're going to go back in and go to reports, go back to the STRS advance option, and they're going to click on that create submission file. And once they do that, it sets the advance flag on the compensation records to a check mark or basically true. So that STRS advance field is going to have a check mark. And what it will also do, it places the total accrued um, contribution amount, so anything that the employees are going to be paying to STRS over the advance period, it's going to put that figure out into the STRS advance configuration under the system configuration as well as the advance mode box. So on that uh, system configuration record, let me just get out of here and I'll show it to you. We already saw it once, I think, but. We'll go back to it. I can get out of here. All right. Come on. So once they've ran that and created the file, if they if you look out in the configuration, it would be the STRS STRS advanced configuration. It's going to it's going to have a dollar amount sitting on the advance amount field. If I can get that to pull up, come on. This. Oh, hold on. I'm a, <laughs> I expired, hold on. <laughs> there we go. Try again. All right. Yeah, so right here, this advanced amount field, the dollar amount for the advance gets set, and you'll also notice that this advanced mode flag gets set as well. So both things happen once it created the submission file. All right. Um, and again, another thing that happens is the annual submission file gets created. So at this point, the district can print and save any uh, reports that they basically want to save. And again, the uh, advanced report, the uh, the uh, SRSAD report that contains everyone, the non-advanced report, they probably already have that saved somewhere in a folder or a desktop. So it's up to them, you know, whether they want to print them out. Some districts print them out and put them in a folder. It's up to them. They can do whatever they want. Um, one thing to keep in mind, if 
a district has third party data like Ren Hill or you know one of those companies that that they basically have employees that are working at the district and they have that data need, need that data for those employees needs to be reported to SCRS um, the district is going to want to get the file from the third party vendor and then since we don't have a merge process in the redesign right now what the what's going to have to happen is the district is going to have to take the file that they get from the third party vendor as well as their their SRS advanced submission file they're going to have to securely send it to the ITC all right at the ITC at that point is going to take both of those files put them in their old classic database, okay? And then they're gonna have to run that uh, SCRS merge option to merge the third-party data with the SCRS advance file for the, for the fiscal year. Once that gets done, then the ITC can take that file that gets created, send it securely back to the, the user at the district. Once the user has that file, they're going to actually then go back to that. Oh, darn it, this thing keeps popping here. So then once the district has the file back, they're going to go out to the reports option, go to SRS Advanced, and they're going to go in and click the Choose File button. And then they're going to find that file that you sent back to them. And they're going to click the Submit Upload, Uploaded File to the STRS button. And once they do that, then their advanced file is sent to STRS for the fiscal year. <clears throat> um, another option we have is a surcharge report, just like we have in Classic. So the district can go to Report and then go down to the STRS surcharge report option. Uh, that surcharge report just gives you uh, its additional employer charge that basically is levied on the district because of salaries that are lower than the SCRS members. The uh, minimum compensation for 2019 was $21,600. So any employee that is under that threshold is probably going to show up on the surcharge report. So the district's just going to want to keep it because I believe SCRS will probably send them something for surcharge and then they can actually take that and compare it and verify, you know, yeah, this person really should be on this report. Um, so again, it just creates a, a worksheet that they, they can keep for a later date and then verify. And then I have a link here to the SARS um, surcharge information if you want to go out and look at that. Um, correcting mistakes. Okay, if a payroll has not been processed, so let's just say that they set the advance flags and all of a sudden they discovered, oh my gosh, these two people should have been in the advance and they're not. I messed up, I really screwed up. Okay, if they have not processed the pay, what you can do is out on the wiki, I put two mass change definitions one of them is to be able to change the advanced flag from change it to true. And the other one is to change it to false, okay? So what you could do is go to that mass change definition and you could actually load that JSON file into, you could import it into the mass load option and then you could process it because basically what we're wanting to do is unflag all of those advanced employees who want to unflag that SCRS advanced flag. So you can use that uh, mass load definition to do that. Another thing you're going to have to do as well, you'd have to go into that system configuration record and then go to the SCRS advanced configuration and you're going to uncheck the advanced mode and you're going to also remove the adva advanced amount. So basically it's like they're kind of like starting over because you've unflagged all the employees, you've taken out the advanced amount, unflagged the advanced mode, so then they can actually go in and they can correct the mistake so they can make their corrections in order to get these two people that they missed on the advanced report. So they're gonna go in, make corrections, rerun these reports, the report, the advanced reports to make sure that everything looks good. 
then they can re rerun the SRS advanced submission file and create the new submission file with the correct data on it. Now, if a payroll has already been processed once or in advance, um, it's kind of too late. So the district is going to basically just going to have to talk to STRS regarding that employee and then they'll have to file the corrections as needed with STRS. Third option, that you at the ITC can actually restore the files to backup before they actually start processing and pay, which I don't think that you're going to want to do. But again, I just want to give you the option in case you you felt that that was necessary. So Lori, that would mean we would need to put a step in their checklist for them to call us for us to initiate a backup on the Docker server because there's no way for them to initiate a backup. No, exactly. Have a to restore to. Say that again, you wouldn't have a backup to restore to. Yeah, otherwise we wouldn't have the backup to restore to. We'd have a nightly backup, but not the point in time when they need to be backed up to. Right, yeah, yeah. Well, I see what you're saying. Like, okay, if they process the advance today and then they process the pay today, yeah, that would be a problem because you really wouldn't have a back. Well, you could back them up to last night, but then they would have to do the advance and everything all over again. You know what I'm saying? Because if nothing, if you did that, nothing that they did today is basically out there, I think. Does that make sense? It does. That's what I was thinking. I just wanted to make yeah. sure I was on yep. the same page. You were thinking, you were thinking right. <laughs> At least that's what I'm thinking. <laughs> I don't know if it's right or not, but that's what I'm thinking. <laughs> okay. Um, Another thing for the district, just to keep in mind, the fiscal year date amounts on the, like the 450, 591, and 691 payroll items, those will not be updated by any accrued contributions or earnings. Just keep that in mind. So every time they you're paying on the advance, that's not getting updated on there, just like in Classic. Um, the fiscal year date amount, uh, the gross amount on the dashboard, obviously will, will be updated regardless, doesn't matter. And then the fiscal year date amounts on the 455, 91, and 691 records will be updated for any new earnings or in contributions. So if they have, you know, miscellaneous pay, whatever, those those earnings or those contributions actually do go out on the fiscal year to date amount on the payroll items. <coughs> During the advance, just like in classic, there are certain pay types that cannot be used when you're in advance. Um, and the SRS advanced box is checked or marked on the compensation record, that would be a reg pay type or an irregular pay type. Um, there are certain pay types that affect the balance on the configuration screen, on that advanced configuration screen. Those pay types would be like a dock, a back pay, a termination of pay, and the payoff. And you'll see the termination and the payoff Usually that just like a few cents difference, makes it a few cents difference. Um, another thing to keep in mind that the number of pays can be modified so that the pays and pays paid are different by one. So maybe they have an employee who they want to pay off early they, during the advance. They can do that just like, in, like we used to do in Classic. We could go in and make those pays and pays paid one different to pay off the employee. Um, I, but if you do that, just remind the district to keep in mind, if you end up doing that, you pay off somebody early, the configuration could be off as far as your advance amount. You may not be correct at the end of the advance. Okay, um, after um, each pay is processed, when you're in advance, the district could, uh, could go out and just verify the, the amount paid back on that configuration screen, the advanced configuration screen, is increasing. Because so each time an advance is processed, during the advanced payroll is processed, if you go out and look at that configuration screen, you're, there's a payback field, it'll show, you know, like an amount. So like the first pay of maybe $20,000, okay? The next pay is twenty, you know, forty thousand. So it it always just keeps adding to that payback amount. Um, okay, so then after all of the summer pays are completed, the the pay, about paid back is zeroed out. So in reality, that figure should be zeroed out. 
if the payback is less than the calculated advance amount, the payback is going to continue to display on the screen. So basically meaning they're, they're off somewhere. Something is not correct. Like what they reported to STRS is not what was processed during the advance period. Um, so uh, where was I here? The districts uh, will not come out of the advance. So basically, they, they'll still be sitting in the advance. So individual compensations that met the criteria for coming out of the advance will still have the advance flags updated. So any employee, basically meaning any employee that had the SCRS flag mark that came out of the, of the advance correctly, it's, go, it's going to be unchecked. They're going to be out of the advance. Um, if the payback is greater than, the, than or equal to the calculated advance, the district advance flag is set to false. Okay, so if the payback amount is not zeroed out, so basically maybe there's a negative amount sitting out there or something's not right, um, the district can go in and run a report um, and compare that report to their advanced positions report. Under reports, there's an SSDT check STRS advance report, just like the STRS AD report in Classic. They can run that report, compare it to the advanced positions report, and they should be able to determine who did not pay during the advance what was reported to STRS based on those, the figures on both reports. When they've gone through and done that, if they figure out who the employer or employees are, they're going to have to file corrections with STRS as needed. And then once they do that, then we could actually go out and make sure that the um, that payback amount gets removed and the, and the um, advance mode gets unchecked. You can do both of those things. You can make modifications to both of those. Oops. Okay. Well, hold on here. Um, I think that's everything. Does anybody have any other questions? I know we had a lot of really good questions and I've got everything written down as far as things that I'm going to add to the checklist. And then I will show you too um, what I was talking about as far as those uh, mass change definitions. Let me go back out here because like I said, those are out there. I put those out there on the wiki. I can get to them here. Oh, that's a processing schedule. I don't want that. Okay, let me just go out to the wiki real quick here and we'll we'll kind of look at everything so you guys can see it all. And I'm sure you've already seen it sitting out there, but um, just to verify. And then, does anybody else have any other questions? Hey, Lauren, this is Bonnie. I got a question. In the event sure. somebody asks us for convert advance, is that in their hands now? Or is there no way to do that? Say that again, I'm sorry. Com in, in classic, you have convert advance, CNV, DV. The submission of the file, yeah, that's a, that's the district's responsibility. Yeah, I mean, if they if they don't have any third party data that needs to be included, once they've created their submission file, they're going to actually go in and click that option to submit the file right to us here. Us, is that what you're that's asking? Not what I'm asking. No, that's not what I'm asking. I'm asking. Oh. We get questions every year about I have to take this person out of advance because I've got to modify his record somehow. So in classic you had CNV ADV. Correct. That, yeah, that mass change definition, that's what I was talking about. We don't have the capability of going in. Um, I guess you could mass change one person, but in reality you probably really don't want to do that. I mean, unless it's before they've ran a payroll, but I mean, in, in reality, you're probably going to want to make a new file. You know what I'm saying? You're saying they, they, they don't want this person in advance. Is that what you're saying? No, I'm saying they've paid a couple of pays and then all of a sudden they've decided somebody's left. They need to modify the obligation, whatever. 
um, and oh, they want gotcha. taken out of advance. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. That's like I was I was talking like basically you're saying they they're what they want to pay them off. Is that what you're talking about or no? Yeah. Usually. Yeah. Usually. Yeah. So basically, at that point, that's when you would go in and change those that pays paid to one less, and then it's going to pay them off. You're going to be changing that pays paid. So, like, let's say right now it says pays 26, pays paid 23. You're going to change that pays to 24. So then when they run the next payroll, it's going to pay them off anything that they're owed. Okay, I guess I'm asking. I understood that they could change the pays paid, but can are they restricted in changing the amounts? Um, I don't. Hold on. I, I remember asking Andy this question. Let me look and see what he said. I think he said, no, I think he said they could change the amounts, if I remember correctly. Because I remember asking him that question. Let me look here. I can find it. Um... Okay, so basically if they wanted to edit the, you know, the advanced flag on the compensation record, they can't do that. You can't manually do that. Um, definition. Okay. I want to say yes, that you can still make changes to those. You know, I know what you're saying. In Classic, there's certain fields that got basically grayed out. They couldn't make changes to them. I'm thinking in redesign, they can make changes to them. I will verify that with Andy. But I'm almost sure that he said that they, that you can make changes to those records or those amounts. But I will double check and I'll let you know for sure. Does that sound good? Yeah, sorry, I was muted. <laughs> I was like, hello, hello, are you there? <laughs> okay, does anybody else have any other questions? Hey, Lori, I, we do, just a real quick one. We had a couple districts last year um, that the employees that were in advance, maybe they changed positions. So what uh -huh. they were doing was changing job one to job two, and job one obviously was in advance, and then they were making job one, their brand new job, and it allowed them to do that in classic. Mm -hmm. And, of course, when they did that, it jaked everything up real good. Um, yeah. Are they going yeah. to be allowed to change those position numbers if they if a compensation is in advance mode, will it allow them to make that change in redesign? Um, I will have to ask the programmers that question. I don't want to tell you yes and, <laughs> and have it be wrong. Okay. Basically, you're saying, uh, okay, right now you have somebody that's a teacher. Now he's going to be a principal. They want the principal to be job one, but actually the right. teacher is job one right now. But now... Exactly. Yeah, I, I, got, I got what you're saying. I will ask them about that because I know in, in classic we used to have that save advance at IDX file. So it basically kept all the old information when it was processing the advance. So that's why it didn't really make any difference. You know what I mean? When they changed that as far as the job number. Um, I will double it, check it, that. With it, it changed us. It changed ours. Like it really just jacked up their stuff. It, up when it they caused a problem. It caused a big problem. Yeah. Yeah. So I will talk to them. Yeah. If they could yeah. program a slap on the wrist, that'd be awesome. <laughs> like, no, you can't do this. <laughs> yes, ma'am. In advance. So basically, give them like a warning or a may not even allow them to do it. Really. Yeah. Just not let them do it. I mean. They, they can make yeah. other adjustments, I would think, or at least, at, but here's the thing. If redesign would allow it to do it, then it would follow that position that's flagged and and no harm, no foul. But in class, that's not what works right now. So Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yep, I will talk to the programmers about that and tell them, hey, 
we need to make it so they can't change those position numbers <laughs> once they're in advance. They can't just go around and be changing stuff around. So, yep, I will definitely tell them that. No problem. Any, any other questions? Lori, I have another one about uh, that similar topic. Um, we used to be able to fool the system by saying, you know, if I knew somebody wasn't going to complete their contract. But, mm -hmm. And so in the advance, we would either put a retro next pay or a doc next pay or something like that that would fix it. Yeah. Is that going to be uh, okay to do that? You know, that's a good question. I'm, I, I thought about that. Uh, when I was doing the, the PowerPoint because there is no like dog next pay field on the compensation record like there is on the job screen. And I know because normally, you know, they do everything in, in future. It'll do doc or retro or whatever. But I don't know like if if when it advances, if it'll look at that. I'm going to have to ask the, the programmers about that because I know what you're saying as far as, as far as fooling it because we used to tell people, you know, if you know that somebody's going to be docked, go ahead and put it in the dock next pay or the retro next pay. But we don't have that capability. Now, unless they, you do it in future, and the question is, if you're doing it in future, is it going to actually even know it with the, with the advance? That question I don't know. But I will ask the guys that question. So basically, full system, retro next pay or doc next pay before advance. And then when you did the advance, it kind of actually knew what was going to be going on. Okay. I will talk to them and find out. And I will, I will send the responses for all three of these questions to everybody. So that way you guys know what I found out from the programmers. Is that okay with everyone? Does that sound good? Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Any other questions? Okay. I think we're good. And then you guys have a great weekend and hey, a great Lori, Memorial yeah. weekend, I guess. Well, yep, go ahead. <laughs> Hi, it's Michelle. Would you mind uh, making me presenter again? I did add a <laughs> I did add a couple slides um, regarding the uh, EMSR integration, and so I just wanted to point those out to you guys. Um, I did a little homework here while Lori was speaking, and I have those uh, <clears throat> I have those set up. I might All be right. able to make myself presenter again, Lori. Let me see. I've just uh, I got to go down here, Michelle. Did you change role to presenter? I Oops, never mind. You already did it. <laughs> yes. I think I've got okay. it now. So I'm You're just quicker than I <laughs> That's all right. Okay. Um, what I've done is I've added a couple slides. I inserted a couple in here. Um, after I talked about um, the financial data, data reporting, I just had an FYI of where the information is pulled from. I added a couple slides, and one of them, has the link where configuring SOAP service with uh, either USSR or USPSR too. Uh, there's a link out there that talks about any kind of SOAP service, but in the middle of that document, it talks about the EMIS um, SOAP service uh, configuration and integration. So what I have here is just kind of steps that, you know, obviously, you know, your ITC is going to follow, um, you know, what all is in this link. Um, but just to point out the EMIS SIF integration, um, again, making sure that the EMIS SOAP service configuration is set up in USAS. And then you have to create a user in USAS R and give that role. There's an SSDT EMIS underscore SIF role that's already out there, and you're going to give that SIF role to them. And so I kind of have a screenshot of what that looks like. And then obviously create a password as well. And so then um, each um, district is going to have their own endpoint. And I have an example down here of the SOAP endpoint for EMIS, and I have that highlighted. So here's the USAS one, and then down here obviously is the payroll one. And so you know a user account has to be created in USAS R for that SIF role, and then 
Then this next slide talks about the SIF agent integration. So I'm basically taking what was in that link that has the SOAP service information and just pulling out the EMIS information on it. So a username and password was uh, created for the EMIS SIF account. That will need to be entered now into the EMIS agent zone configuration. And so down here specifically, it shows the SOAP URL. Um, so this is the EMIS um, SOAP um, endpoint and then that username that was created in the redesign and the password. So that needs to be entered in the SOAP connection area. So I just kind of wanted to touch upon that since um, you guys had asked about it. And I said, I'll put these in the slides and then you guys can do whatever you want with it. You can take them out for your presentations to um, your districts because it's probably more just for you guys. But I just wanted to put it in there and I also updated the checklist a little bit as well and just put in a little note around the EMIS extract that talks about this as well. Okay, any other questions? Okay, everybody. Um, I want to thank everyone so much. And like I said, Lori and I will do a little bit of homework we need to. Um, I know I need to check in on those zip file formats. So if you guys um, have any questions in the meantime, please post a, a ticket to the service desk. We'll try to help you guys. And we're kind of all in this together when it comes to fiscal year and then the redesign. So please, just um, any questions you guys have, just let us know. All right. Thanks, everyone. Have a great holiday weekend. Thank you. you have too. a good weekend, everybody. Thank you. You too.